Helen and I'm going to talk to you about the songs on my new album, Drawing On My Dreams. The picture is, uh, I did that when I was five or six years old and uh, I've only found it fairly recently. Um, I used to draw girl groups all the time. Um, I never thought that I was going to be in a band or anything like that when I was little. Couldn't have ever imagined that. So it was kind of an obsession that they just looked so exciting to me. I was always convinced they were friends and they were just singing about things that, uh, that came about through their friendships. And uh, so it seemed like a good idea to put that as, as an album cover because um, of that sense of surprise. <laughs> In particular because this is the first time I've actually engineered one of my own albums. I've always produced them myself, but um, this was my first time as an engineer at the kitchen table using an old version of Logic called Logic Express and just having to get around any problems because a lot of it was done during lockdown and uh, using the kitchen as a reverb and all of those kind of things. Um, so I'll get started. It's called Beach Walk and um, when we were little, we used to go with our mum and dad uh, to the west coast of Scotland and we used to pick up mussels and inside some of the mussels it was like chance, there might be a pearl or something like that and my mum actually got a tiny little pearlised crab um, she found in a mussel shell and it's this idea of searching for something um, that's going to surprise you when you're just doing something quite ordinary like going for a walk and uh, the track itself has been released as an uh, instrumental years and years ago but the person that I recorded it with didn't like the words and just by serendipity I found the words in a pile of old papers and thought oh, I'm going to try these with the song and I thought like, actually this has kind of got a bit of a groove and that same thing you know getting to a beach and walking around and you're searching for something you don't know what it is it's quite a, a metaphor for life especially if you're a creative person you don't really know what it is you're looking for oh it's that thing over there and then you get there and it's there suddenly it's over there and so that's really what the song's about the second track all i want is a song of empathy uh, of feeling somebody's pain so much that it's almost unbearable and you want to be able to take some of their pain yourself so that they don't have to suffer so much um, i think probably a lot of people have felt like this before and um, sometimes when I'm playing this song live I, I, I can't finish it because that feeling is so strong and I'm, I'm thinking about people that I know who are having really terrible problems with mental health and I just have to uh, stop playing it so it's really good that I recorded it because it's there and um, if that happens it's not such a terrible thing. Well um, Wake Up was written the day after President Biden took office because I think a lot of people thought that Trump was going to be there forever and he was just going to rampage through the whole of the United States and then rampage through the rest of the world and destroy everything and suddenly wake up one morning and Trump's gone and there's a person here who's got progressive policies I mean everybody you know every politician no no politicians is, is perfect but it was just that change of mood um, and I wanted to have another voice there and I decided to send the track to Anne Wood who plays violin for the um, Raincoats and herself as well. She's classically trained but she's got this lovely kind of woody f kind of sound to her violin and um, she asked me for, you know, what do you want me to do? And I said, well, speak to me, speak back to me, have a conversation um, with me, with your, your string playing. And when she sent it back and I put it into the track, I just thought that is just absolutely perfect. Um, so it's almost like inviting Anne to the party, you know, and uh, I'm just really delighted. All the way from Ullapool, you know, magic. Amazonia's, Amazonia is my commentary on, um, on what happened during the pandemic when people were ordering things and it was showing up in advance of their door coming to their home. And it was tracing back that supply chain all the way back to the factories in Bangladesh, in China, in Leicester even, where people were crammed together with no thought about their health, no thought about their well-being, no thought about how much they were being paid, um, all to give us luxuries in the Western world. And it's very easy to forget about this when all you're doing is clicking on a website. Um, and maybe you see a big, um, storage facility from the train going past or something and but the whole thing is rotten right the way through to the people who are delivering to you who are paying really bad wages and being treated really badly 
and um, it's dressed up in uh, quite a beautiful piece of music and um, one of the people I sent it to, oh, yeah, so, you know, somebody's writing a song about the rainforest, it, it's so not, you know, and um, yeah, it's, I suppose it's a bit of a song with a message, or a lot of a song with a message, so um, yeah, I hope the message comes across. Well, I've always been fascinated by the story of Pandora, and apparently it's not right anyway, it's, it's been retold so many times it's turned into a really misogynistic story. But I kind of had a bit of a love-hate relationship with it because I thought it was really terrible that women were blamed for every single ill in the world, but we all know this already, don't we? But also quite fun. There was a bit of a frisson of excitement imagining this woman sort of opening a box and all of these terrible things coming out. And in my mind's eye, I could see it really clearly. And right at the bottom, there's this tiny little hope thing. Um, and I read a book by Peter McFarlane called Underland and the last chapter of the book talks about um, a storage facility in, in Finland where masses and masses and masses of nuclear waste is being stored and it's lots of layers of things to keep it safe but the main worry is that in future years archaeologists will say oh what's this and open it up and of course that'll be the end of the world. So um, I kind of put those two ideas together. It's one of those songs that while I was writing it, while I was singing it and while I was recording it, I felt quite fearful at the same time as performing it. And I've hidden a lot of odd little reverby, echoey um, messages in it to try to um, show how sinister the whole idea is. Well, things like this is literally thinking something and putting that thought to music because things like this don't happen to people like me is something that I've thought throughout my whole life ever since I first walked onto a stage in a punk band it's like, what what how, how come this is happening and almost everything I mean I never set out to be a university lecturer which I'm not anymore but I never set out I never thought I'd write a book um, so many things I never thought when I was this age that I would still be making music and touring I never thought I'd record my own, own album and so it's got a bit of a quirky rhythm. Um, I was lucky enough to meet Lindy Morrison from the Go-Betweens who was drumming for a band called The Girl With A Replaceable Head um, from Newcastle and I knew them from back in the day and they invited me to support them and I travelled back from Brighton with Lindy on the train and we just really got on with each other. So I thought, I'm going to ask her if she can drum and very, very quickly had to set up a studio session because she only had a couple of days left before she went back to Australia. And she's done a fantastic job. And you don't actually hear her right till the end of the song. I have a double bass player on it called Emma Goss who plays with Sarah Vista, really great double bass player. And the song kind of builds to uh, the final feeling of things like this don't happen to people like me, but they did. <laughs> Coffee and Hope started life as a conversation when I was in Glasgow. I'd, I'd been up there to do a gig and um, we went out to a nightclub and I met some people who um, were in a band called Dragged Up actually and we were just kind of talking, very late night talking. I can't even really remember what we were talking about but it, I just sort of thought how can everything be so terrible but not feel so terrible sometimes and I came back and I wrote this song and, and around that time it was um, there were terrible um, droughts in Australia and a lot of um, fires and the idea that everything was on fire that monk painting of the scream where you just want to scream but somehow you know you, you can't do that and my style of dealing with things is to unfold things and I thought can I make a song where this whole idea of feeling so desperate um, just kind of unfolds and it's it's not shouting at people it's inviting people in to listen and this conundrum of the fact that we have to keep hope even though head, uh, inside our heads we're screaming so that's what that song's about um, a book called The Hidden Life of Trees by Peter Vorleben and it's all about the way that trees communicate with each other, not, not just through their leaves, which they do, and their branches, which they do, but underneath, um, through threads of fungus called mycelium, 
which we sometimes, they sometimes poke up and, you know, it's a little mushroom or a, a toadstool or something. But they send electronic pulses to each other. They talk amongst themselves in a language that we can't understand. We don't speak tree, you know, they're probably talking about us. But there's something really beautiful about this idea, about this commentary and this communication and sharing of knowledge. Um, and over lockdown, all of these walks, suddenly I discovered that I lived in the countryside. I thought I lived in a really boring suburb that you had to get tubes everywhere from, you know, to escape. And suddenly it became a really great place to live. There were all these walks through fields and forests and things. And I became really, really close to, to trees and to their shapes. And it, it, you know, they seem like they're making all these dancing shapes and they probably are. You know, if we were, we, we're like little gnats buzzing around because their, their way of moving is really slow because it's through growth. So Wood Wide Web is about them. And I invited Steve Beresford, who's an electronic artist, um, to make some noises. And this one was really fun to mix because uh, I, I could make the sounds go from one side to the other. And at one point I got so excited about this that the actual track almost disappeared. <laughs> so I had to be reminded that it, I actually had a song there and I should, um, the song was the thing and the little noises moving backwards and forwards were a sort of added extra. Um, but I love singing it because every time I sing it, I get back to, I go straight back into those woods, that smell of trees and the sound of the leaves rustling and um, absolute heartbeat of life in those forests. On another one of those walks, um, in a different direction, I was walking down by something called the Dolly, Dollis Brook, which should really be called the Dollis Trickle because there's hardly ever there. Very, very early one morning. It was very grim outside, it's very gray. Um, and I spotted a, a flash of, of white in, in the trees. And I thought, that looks as though it should be a heron, but it's not a heron. So I, I kind of waited and I crept through the trees. And there was this beautiful, tiny white bird in the shape of a heron. And I managed to take a photograph and Somebody said, oh, that's a little egret. And I looked them up and they, they live in France mostly, but they do come to, they do come to the south of England sometimes. Um, and I was so fascinated by it. And in, through the pandemic, terrible things were happening, people getting terribly ill. And a, a family member got really, really ill during the pandemic and they were in hospital. And they texted me and they said, there's a little egret, I can see a little egret. And this is right in the middle of London. So the birds became really symbolic of, um, of nature kind of reclaiming our, uh, our lives a bit during the pandemic. Um, but because it's such a strange, was such an odd thing, and because it was really kind of linked to illness, I made the chords not really resolve. I wanted the song to still seem like a question mark. Um, rather than being a complete, um, complete entity in itself. It kind of goes round and round and round, just wondering. After the storm was written in the corner of a field, <laughs> I wanted to write a song that was quite different from the other ones I write, that are usually quite compact. I mean, sometimes I write songs that are only two minutes long, but I wanted to spread out the landscape of the song into a much wider um, viewpoint and it's inspired by the idea of old buildings and how buildings become ruins um, but their significance is rethought every time people discover them and also the idea of buildings becoming a sanctuary and practically the worst thing that you can do to a person is to smash up their, their home um, which is what was happening all the way through with Aleppo and, and all of this kind of thing. And um, I was thinking about how churches and temples and mosques and synagogues are so much a sanctuary, they're, they're much more um, than places for religion to happen. They often shelter people who are in extreme distress. And in particular in my head, I was thinking about this little church in Sutherland in the north of Scotland where 
Um, people went, they, they were farmers and they were driven off their land by the aristocracy who basically pillaged, burned, killed because they wanted their land for their sheep farms and the people took sanctuary in this tiny little sh church and they scratched messages on the glass and um, I found that so moving. So it's this idea of a, a, of a place of safety which sometimes you have to create metaphorically because it's just not there and the song is an attempt to try and make somewhere in the space of five minutes where um, a person feels safe um, because sometimes in the physical world that's just not there. There are three bonus tracks on the uh, band camp. One of them is called Set in Stone and it's about, um, it's about statues and at the time that it was written it was written really really immediately as a response to the um, Colson statue being toppled but I really thought a lot about statues at the time and how often statues and medals are, you know, they're given to completely the wrong people. Um, and it's the people, it's the cleaners and the dustmen and the NHS workers, the porters, the cleaners, the nurses, the doctors. It's these people who we depend on for our health and well-being, people who work in shops, you know, delivery drivers, all of these people. They're the people who ought to have statues and they're the people that ought to have medals. And just because we need a lot of them and they don't seem to be rare, it doesn't mean that they're not valuable. Um, I'm wondered about whether put, to put the song on onto the album because it seemed as though a moment had passed, but I don't think that moment's gonna pass for a long time. Um, the next one is Home Prison. And that's written, I wrote it about um, my own experience of living with a coercive controller, of having my family uh, turned against me, of having my friends' friendships curtailed, of being made to feel that small. And I transplanted that to pandemic situation where you're even more cut off from people. Um, and I've tried to convey that combination of fear and resignation and that feeling that it's never gonna end. Um, and in actual fact, I'm living proof that it can end, but when you're actually in that situation, you just think that's a forever situation. And last of all, there's a song called Compass Points, which is a song about being lost in the fog. And uh, again, it's quite metaphorical, although it's written from a perspective of a real experience of being in Hampstead, which is like one of the most posh and secure and you know, inhabited parts of London on a really foggy night and thinking, actually, I don't know where I am. So that's, that's my album. I hope you enjoy it. And big thanks to Loud Women for inviting me to do this. It's got me, it's caught me, it shrouds wrap around me, I'm caught in